Good morning. Welcome to the Live Street Church of Christ Saints. And to all of you who are viewing, we want to invite you into our worship services today. We hope and pray that your experience with us today will be fruitful, uplifting, uh, and edifying. With the Live Street Church of Christ, we exist for the purpose of glorifying God through serving others. And we're bent on making every member a minister so we can be equipped to take his message to the masses. And so today, we have to acknowledge the fact that we're in perilous times. Because of this pandemic, lives are being lost at an alarming rate. Households are being shattered, and economically we're all suffering, and this, this is a myriad of problems going on. It's enough to make a believer wonder where is God. So today I want to give you a message that I hope and pray will bless your life. It, it has everything to do with our acknowledgement of God's activity in our lives, even in times of pandemic. Even in time of political, economic, and social unrest, God is still on the throne. And today I want to give you some things to take with you that's going to help you to acknowledge God's activity. God is working for you. God is working in you. And God desires to work through you. So join us today in our services, and I hope that you are blessed. today as we attend to worship God in the best way we know how, which is in spirit and in truth. God has blessed us all so much, and there's so much to be thankful for. That's why the Bible says that we are praising his holy name, for he is worthy to be praised, and God is definitely worthy to be praised today. And we thank you so much for joining us, and as we enter into our worship service, in order to get our minds right and our hearts right, in order to focus solely on God, we do this thing called our call to worship, where we repeat words of the Bible that get ourselves, our spirits, our hearts in a mode to worship God. So I'm going to ask that wherever you're at today, if you're joining us via all the different social media platforms, if you are able to stand, that you would please stand and repeat after me as we recite Psalms 100, which is our call to worship. Psalms 100, our call to worship. And it reads... Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us. It is he who hath made us. And not we ourselves. And not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with Praise. And praise. Be thankful unto him. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. And bless his name. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. 
His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. His truth endures to all generations. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, creator of the heavens and earth, we thank you, Father God, for allowing us to walk into thy throne room presence to praise and worship you today. Understanding, Father God, that this is not a right that we have earned or a right that we were, Father God, that we demanded, but one, Father God, that was given to us as a blessing through the blood of your son, Christ Jesus. We thank you so much, Father God, for the cleansing blood that makes us white as snow, that makes us and renews us, Father God, each and every day. We pray, Father God, that we walk worthy to the vocation by which we are called and circumspectly to thy word, Father God, as we know that your word is a lamp unto our path and a light unto our feet. We pray, Father God, you allow us to exude love to all those we come in contact with. During a time where there is more division, where there is more misinformation, where there is more turmoil and trial than ever, Father God, allow us to be stronger than ever. Allow us to be more useful than ever, as pronounced as ever, Father God, that we may speak your truth, Father God, that we may speak your love, Father God, that we may speak your hope to a dying and perishing world. We pray, Father God, for all those who are sick, especially those of the household of faith. We pray, Father God, for all those who are downtrodden, that you will uplift them and raise them up. We pray, Father God, for our leaders, that they make right decisions, Father God, for the flock that you have placed them over. And we pray, Father God, that we would worship you in spirit and truth this day. In the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, we do pray. Amen. As we enter into our communion services, we are now commemorating the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the portion that we call communion of the Lord's Supper. It is now that we prepare our hearts and minds. I really love the to sit at a table with you, uh, to celebrate uh, our deliverance from death to life. And as we take of this bread, we are examining ourselves and we're really looking at our relationships, uh, our relationship with you and our relationship with one another. And we are declaring by faith that we are endeavoring to be as unleavened as this bread. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Again, a man examined himself and eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Again, discerning uh, uh, the fullness of the sacrifice of Jesus uh, when he shed his blood for our cleansing. And in, in a beautiful way, we are also declaring, as we partake of this, that we too are willing to uh, sacrifice for the cause of Christ. In other words, we put God first. Uh, as we prioritize, prioritize our lives, he is the preeminent one. He is first and foremost in our lives. And we declare it as we partake of the fruit of the vine. Let us pray. Merciful God, our Father, as we partake of this cup, uh, we do so remembering the sacrifice of Jesus and then declaring our willingness to sacrifice as well for the building of the kingdom of God to the advancement of the call of Christ. Please uh, bless us and give us the, imbibe us with power uh, to be true to those pledges. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as we continue in the fellowship component of our worship, another uh, facet of that worship is the celebration of the gift of giving, the grace of giving. Uh, I want to share with you a passage that I hope would help to uh, really center our hearts on the attitude and disposition that we ought to possess when it comes to giving back to the Lord. If you recall, in the first chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, there is a situation uh, where Jesus uh, encounters and cleanses one who uh, was uh, shackled by the, uh, the uh, disease of leprosy. And because of his leprosy, he was alienated from the camp. He could not worship. He could not come in contact with, uh, with others. Therefore, he was ostracized spiritually, uh, socially, and every other facet of life had been impacted by this disease. But when he came to Jesus, he came and he began to beg Jesus, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, uh, unto him, if thou will, thou can make me clean. And Jesus was moved with compassion. And, and then notice what he did. He broke protocol. He put his hands on him and touched him and said, I am willing to be clean. As soon as he had spoken immediately, the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And straightway he charged him, uh, he charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And he said to him, and this is the part I want you to get, church. He said, "See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them." In other words, he was to go and make an offering. The point I want to make is, as we go through life, we do and we give for the upbuilding of and the advancement of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. In other words, to support the local congregation. We understand that. And let me just pause and say we appreciate those who may be listening, who may not even be a member of, our, of this congregation, but have been blessed by what you've been receiving. And you want to give it off. And I like to say you can do that uh, by going online and pushing the proper prompts uh, as it relates to online giving. Uh, but to the family, I'm just simply saying, when God has blessed you, uh, this is not to say, uh, this is over and above your regular giving. I'm trying to speak to the heart today. We give because, you know, it is a demonstration of our faith, righteousness. But when God blesses you, and, and even as you are in this pandemic, we're all in the same together. But as God continues to bless you, as he does miraculous things in your life, and he moves in your life, you ought to respond with the spirit of thanksgiving. And this man, Jesus, charged him to go show yourself to the priest and make an offering. Make an offering according to the commandments of Moses over in Leviticus chapter 14. So again, if God has been good to you, uh, I encourage you to let him know by giving an offering over and above what you usually give. Okay? God will bless you in that. Because if God has been good to you, he wants you to be good in kind. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to express, number one, our dependence on you when we give of our first fruit. 
uh, but also uh, to express uh, our love for one another as we give benevolently. As you have blessed us, we want to give back an offering as well as the sacrificial portion of our means uh, for the building of your kingdom to bless others, to become a blessing to others that you may in turn continue to bless us. Uh, we give by faith knowing that you are able to supply all of our needs according to your riches in glory. In Jesus' name we do humbly pray. Amen. Well, all day long, of Jesus, I am singing, and he's my son, a joy will ever be, and all the while, he keeps my heart bells ringing, and for his love is everything to me. Good morning and welcome to the Live Street Church of Christ. We hope and pray that your time spent with us today will be time well spent. If you have your Bibles, turn on with me to the book of Ephesians. And I want to give a message to you today that I believe is very timely. In as much as we're living in very perilous times that seem to be calamitated, you know, all around us. And with each passing day, it seems as though uh, the predicament you know, that we find ourselves in uh, is growing more and more dire. Distress is all around us. There is an unease and a, a fear uh, that seems to be permeating, you know, in every household, even in the house of God. There are many of us who are very, very confused and dismayed as to which way to go. And so today I want to give you a message uh, entitled Acknowledging God's Work. Acknowledging God's Work. And we're going to look at this in three different aspects. Acknowledging God's Work in you. Acknowledging God's work for you, and then acknowledging God's work through you. So we're going to look at God's work for you, in you, and through you. So in the book of Ephesians, let me just begin by saying, in order for us to get through these perilous times, we need to understand that God has a purpose for our lives. It seems difficult to comprehend that when we see death all around us. Uh, because of this pandemic in which we find ourselves, people are, uh, let me say, the death toll is rising, you know, day after day after day. And even as we go through these uh, fall and winter months, we have to be mindful of the fact that uh, many say that the worst is yet to come. So what does the believer do in this situation? How do we uh, keep a handle on our sanity? How do we continue to go through life? Uh, uh, with purpose, uh, with joy, and with a sense of expectation, not of the negative things that are going on in this country, but the positive things that God has in store for his children. I want us to understand that, and in order for us to uh, fully appreciate that, we have to know that our being here has everything to do with our full uh, partnership with God. Do you not know that when God, you know, saved us, he also adopted us. And when he adopted us, he also has enlisted us. You see, we have been uh, employed in his army, uh, employed in his service, uh, enlisted into his army. And therefore, we need to understand that as soldiers for Christ, we have to maintain our posture on the battlefield. So therefore, as we understand the partnership uh, with God and his purpose for our lives, that gives us a sense of uh, purpose. It gives us the, the wherewithal to persevere 
even in trying times such as these. So today, I want to provide a proper motivation for full uh, and lifelong devotion and commitment to God. You see, sometimes our devotion seems to wane. We can look back at our lives and talk about the things that we did uh, in the past. But when we look at, you know, the person in the past, it does not match the person in our present because sometimes we allow life and life circumstances to water down our zeal, to tep it and, 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 and dumb down our enthusiasm for the cause of Christ. So therefore, how do we shake that? How do we get back on track? and begin to live a life of uh, purpose as we pursue the abundant life, the life of satisfaction, the life of fulfillment in uh, the purposes of God. And so today I want to talk about, um, first of all, the church, uh, the fullness of Christ. And therefore, if we are the fullness of Christ, our living and our operation has to mimic and, 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 and mirror the life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so today, if we look at the book of Ephesians, uh, the second chapter, verses 1 through 10 today, again, acknowledging God's work for you, acknowledging God's work uh, in you, and ultimately uh, acknowledging God's desire uh, to work through you. The book of Ephesians uh, mirrors many of the other writings of the Apostle Paul. And if you look at the first division of the book of Ephesians, you will, be, you will find the first three chapters that gives us the doctrinal uh, position that he's trying to make. And then verses, uh, chapters 4 through 6 give the practical uh, expression of that doctrinal position. In other words, it's one thing to know about the Word of God, know the teachings of God, know the doctrine of God, but it, it does not manifest in your practical uh, administration of what you have learned, then your learning is in vain. I've said it many times, you know, people want to hear, want to see a good sermon before they want to hear a good sermon. And we've learned enough Bible study, we've been in enough, we've heard enough sermons, we've sang enough songs to, to be able to convert the world. But it's our practice, not our preaching. So this is helping us to practice what we preach. Again, the doctrine of side. Talk about what God has done for us. Our position in Christ Jesus. You know, our salvation. Our deliverance from death to life. All of those things uh, help us to understand what God has done for us. And then what he is trying to accomplish uh, in us. So that ultimately he can do his good work through us. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that we may do what? Walk in them. So, I want to give you three things today. First of all, this passage is designed to help us to realize what God has done uh, for you in verses 1 through 5. And then in verses 6 through 9, we're going to see what God, uh, we have to recognize what God is doing to you. Sometimes, as you go through life, uh, you may get so caught up in your living that you can't really recognize what God is doing in and around your circumstances people who God brings into your life in certain seasons of your life to accomplish certain divine purposes for your life. If we're not sensitive spiritually, we can miss God's activity in your life. And then ultimately, uh, we have to rationalize what God desires to do through you in verse 10. So let's begin there. Notice, uh, again, Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5 says, And you, has he quickened, are made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit uh, that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature uh, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Again, this passage makes it clear uh, that it is essential that we understand the magnitude 
about our deliverance from our former state. The magnitude of our deliverance. See, we were, and the Bible tells us, uh, delivered from the very domain of darkness. We have been uh, delivered from something, but it doesn't stop there. We've also been delivered to something. Colossians chapter uh, 1, uh, verse 13 and following make it very clear that he succinctly states that we were in bondage and trapped and ensnared in uh, the very kingdom of darkness. By the, the domain of darkness, we have been rescued and then delivered from that state into the kingdom of God's dear son, where there is peace, where there is joy and tranquility. When there are a multitude of blessings for the Bible says in Ephesians 1 and verse number uh, 3, uh, that, that all spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Are, you see, your salvation has everything to do with your location, not your disposition, not how good you are. You know, not because, you know, how you grew up going to church and your grandmother played the piano in church and all that kind of stuff. No, 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 it's not your disposition. I'm talking about my life. No, 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 it's not about your disposition. It's about your position. For the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, salvation is based on location. If you are in Christ, uh, there is now no condemnation. If you are in Christ, Ephesians 1 and verse number 3, you avail yourself to all spiritual blessings in heavenly places so they are aware in Christ Jesus. So you must be in Christ in order to benefit uh, uh, from this deliverance from which we speak. Three things about the realization of what God has done for you. Notice uh, the condition of the lost state. He begins this narrative by simply uh, acknowledging what God has done. He says he has quickened or he has made you alive. You who were dead in trespasses and sins. You see, the condition of the lost state is a very dire uh, condition. You see, you were dead through your sins. And when one is dead, it simply means because there's a lot of folks walking around here spiritually dead. They may not be physically dead, but there is a spiritual death. See, the word death simply means separation. Uh, what we talk about in the physical sense is, is, is what separates you from whatever it is that animates your life. Yes, to be to be separated from life. But it also means, as a result of that, it has rendered you insensitive to any outside stimuli. You know, we used to say that, make the statement, give a person the flowers while they are living. You know why? Because when they're dead, they cannot smell the sweetness of the rose. When they're dead, they cannot appreciate the beauty of the living. Uh, when they're dead, they cannot respond to any outside stimuli. In other words, we are now rendered insensitive to God. God is doing a lot of great things in this world, but if we are spiritually dead, we are insensitive. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous, but some are able to receive uh, and reciprocate that love, and others are just insensitive to what God is doing. When you're spiritually dead, it brings you insensitive uh, to God. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, uh, Behold, uh, uh, the arm of the Lord is not too short that he can't save you. Let me look at that. Uh, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear you. But it says your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God and he will not hear you. In other words, our sin uh, is the contributing factor to the separation from God. It's because of your sins that uh, you've been separated. You're now alienated from God. You are now uh, an enemy to God. Notice what Ephesians goes on to say. It says, we're in it has passed. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. In other words, uh, not only are you insensitive to what God is trying to accomplish in your life, uh, not only have you been cut off from a uh, fellowship with God, but now you have a life that is in sin. It says, in which you lived. See, it's one thing to be dead through sin, but then it results in you begin to live a life of sin. Understand that. And when you begin to live a life of sin, you get further and further 
away from the reach of, of God. Not that he cannot reach you, but you are refusing to accept his overture of love. You're refusing to respond to the grace of God in your life. You're refusing to recognize that God appears in your life providentially to give you everything that you need when you need it. See, sometimes we can conflate, uh, we try to equate uh, what you need with what you want. Someone once told me, once told me to God, his answer to our prayer is always yes. But then someone else came and told me, no, sometimes God has to tell you no. And I begin to try to, how I've done those two things, you know what I'm saying? How you balance that, right? Well, I believe that God's answer is always yes. It's yes to his will. Sometimes we interpret that as a no because our will has not conformed to his will. Even the Apostle Paul, when he wanted to make a, a he wanted to go on a certain a missionary journey, he wanted to go in a certain direction, and God closed that door. Well, at first, Paul perhaps thought there was a no until he received a vision to come into Macedonia. And then he began to realize that the providence of God was closing this door in order to open another door. Oh, yes. There was a situation that caused the Apostle Paul to pray three times that God would remove a thorn in the flesh. Yes, he, he, he identified it as a messenger from Satan to afflict him. But you see, uh, he prefaced that statement that, by saying, in order that I might not uh, get the big head, in order that I might not think too much of myself, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. Yeah, you see, sometimes you may see, uh, and then when you begin to ask God about this thing, God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. Notice the word no. He says, uh, this is for a purpose, and this purpose is for you to understand your dependence on me. For you not to get too, you know, high in your thought about yourself. Sometimes we need to be humble. And, and so sometimes what we interpret as a no is a yes according to his will. Because he wants you to aspire to great heights that only he can take you. And so here we are today. Uh, we can find ourselves living a life. A life in sin. Which simply means... Uh, in this text, he said, this is how you used to live. Your manner of life, your walk was all about um, your uh, sin condition. Yes. But the Bible says in Romans 3, he said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every last one of us. But just because you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that does not mean you have to live a life of sin. See, we have made up our minds. I decided to follow Jesus. And what they really mean, it doesn't mean that I've reached this sin of perfection. It means that I am walking in the right direction. I, I'm walking in the light as he is in the light. Yes, I might slip. Yes, I might stumble. Yes, I may even fall. But you know what? I keep on keeping on. I confess my faults. I acknowledge my need for him. And he continues to cleanse me from all of my sins. And I can stand before God in the right status based on my position in Christ Jesus. Not only, not only do we see the condition of a lost state, a state, but the circumstances of that lost state. Again, he says, how you used to walk. How you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. You see, the very spirit that now works uh, in the children of disobedience, among whom ye were, you, ye all had past tense. Our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind. And we were, past it, by nature, the uh, children of wrath, even as others. Yet yeah, we have begun to live a life uh, that had conformed to our conditions. And now the circumstances, our conduct, our communion, and our character. Understand those three things. Your conduct, in other words, you follow the course of this world. Follow the influences of the world. Uh, being moved and shaped uh, by the world. Notice you were uh, uh, living according to societies uh, and the world's dictates. And that formed and shaped your character. It began to, you identified with everybody else. Kind of like in the day of the Noah. Everybody was, you know, in, in lockstep 
doing evil. And sometimes um, we follow the majority. The majority is not always right. You see, if we were still following uh, uh, the majority, I would say that, you know, lynching at one time was legal. But now we see what's going on uh, in the world today. Uh, and all this black crime, not black on black crime, but crime that's being perpetrated against black folk just because they're black. The course of this world uh, is becoming commonplace uh, to see that. And so therefore, not only is it our communion, fellowship with children of disobedience, uh, through the passage of our faith, following the desires of nature, but also as a result, notice what this is. It says, uh, as a result, our character. It says, by nature, you see that? We became objects of God's wrath. See, our character, our very nature, our, 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 our sinful element within us was so powerful that we were just flowing down a course. Some people talk about, I don't want to go with the flow. You be careful about saying this kind of stuff. When you look in the water, the only thing that goes with the flow is dead fish. Everything that's alive is swimming. So when you just go with the course and with the flow, that reveals your death. But not only that, in the light of all that, you see uh, the condition of the lost, and therefore the uh, circumstances of a lost state. There is a calling. Verse number four wakes us up. See, wait, see, see, verse number four is designed to make you shout. Verse number four is designed to make you happy and, and make you uh, realize that all is not lost. It says, but God, yeah, you were an enemy of God. You were rebellious and disobedient, but God, uh, even though you had seen and fallen short of the glory of God, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, has quickened us, has made us alive. We who were dead were made alive. Uh, uh, he quickened us. How? Together with Christ. And by grace, ye are saved. That's important. Why? Because, number one, God has called us out of a lost state. See, it, 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 it identifies and reveals to us uh, his rich mercy. He said, by his rich mercy. See, mercy is able to penetrate death. Remember the passage in Isaiah, Behold, the arm of the Lord is not sharp, not sharp that he cannot save, nor is his ear dull that he cannot hear. You see, when we are dead, remember I said we are separated from uh, spiritual sensitivity. But you see, God is the only one who's able to raise the dead. You can't if you if you are lost, you can't save yourself. It is God who quickens us. It is God whose mercy penetrates of the sin, the death is the dull mind and the dead soul. Only God can resurrect that, and He resurrects it through uh, the spirit quickening of the Word of God. Yes, He's rich in mercy. Uh, he points to the sinner. See, God providentially is pointing the sinner to God. You know, the Bible says over the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, and verse number 6, he said, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is. You have to believe in the existence of God, and that he is every one of them who diligently seek him. So in other words, God is always providentially Pointing dead and lost souls are back to him. Yes, he's directing the sinner. In terms of his principles for righteous, righteous living are found within the covenant relationship that we can now enjoy by virtue of our position in Christ Jesus. You see, uh, the principles are in the covenant, but the picture of his love and mercy is found in the cross. And the more we understand the cross, we now find that the practices are lived out in the church. You see that? 
And so therefore, the principles are in the covenant, the picture is in the cross, but the practice is in the church. By grace, God is initiative to secure us and give us redemption. That's what God has done. But now in the church, we ought to work that stuff out. We ought to come together and begin practices that is going to manifest itself in our personal uh, spirituality and maturity, but also in the efforts and activities of the body of Christ. As we begin to conduct ourselves as the redeemed army of God. But not only that, not only that, awareness of where you came from is designed to lead you to a greater appreciation of where you are right now. We sing the song, Mr. Every Voice and Sing, from verse in Heaven and the Rain, okay? It starts about sing the song to talk about the past, the dark past that God has brought us from. See, we all have some, some places uh, that we have been delivered from. Not only in a generic sense, in the kingdom of Satan, I get that, but in terms of your own personal situation. Sometimes we get caught up in abusive relationships, and God delivered you from that. You have been, you grew up in an alcoholic family, in a dysfunctional family, but now in the family of God, you know, we're all dysfunctional folk. Receiving therapeutic medicine by a loving God. And so regardless of where you came from, you may not have had your beautiful nuclear family like you wanted, but you see, God has given you a new family because you're a new creation, and now you can live a redeemed life, a fruitful life, regardless of where you've been. Because now where you are, helps you to look back and see how far God has brought you. He brought you from a mighty long way. He brought you out of a uh, place of despair and depravity and placed you in the kingdom of God. And you ought to be excited about that. I don't care where you come from. It's important to now see where you are. And then it allows you to look back to the back at your past. Remember last week when I said your past is the past? You can learn from it. The things that were written up for a child were written for your learning. You can learn from it, apply the principle from it, but don't get stuck in this stuff. Yes, and now we understand where God wants to lead us. Let me give this to you real quick, and then the lesson will be yours. We have to recognize what God is doing in you. This is important, because this has everything to do with your sanctification. It has everything to do with now to increase Christ. How do you walk, and how do you talk? How do you act like a child of God? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27, uh, conduct yourselves in a matter worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, if you believe you ought to act like it. And then it begins to lay down some principles uh, that helps us to understand that when we recognize what God is doing in you, it will sustain you, even though we find ourselves in turbulent times. God is always up to something. Understand the manifold significance uh, of your present status. Uh, explicitly to understand the reality of God's grace. See, see, the grace of God is not something we just talk about and sing about. We have to understand, you know, exactly what the reality of God's grace is. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. In other words, um, we have been made alive with Christ. Understand that. And that simply says, it is not something that's based on your performance. It is not something that is based upon what you have achieved. You have been uh, made alive with Christ. Uh, we have been raised from the dead with Christ. You see, Colossians, uh, I'm going to give this to you. Colossians chapter 2 helps us to really fully appreciate uh, just what this means. Notice in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 12, if I can get these glasses over here, it says, well, let me jump up to verse number 10. It says, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power, in whom also ye were circumcised, circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off uh, the body of sin, the filth, of, uh, by the circumcision of Christ. You have been circumcised with a spiritual circumcision. If you ever go back in the Old Testament and understand the word barak, which is, means to cut. Uh, when people, when they were circumcised, they, when, when, when the covenant was made, they had to kill an animal, right? In other words, when they, you didn't just make a covenant, you had to cut a covenant. 
That's the symbolism there. But in circumcision, we receive, we entered into a new covenant. A circumcision that was a spiritual circumcision. The Bible says a circumcision made without hands. And what is indeed this uh, new covenant relationship that we enter into by virtue of this spiritual circumcision? It's positioned in Christ Jesus. How then is that achieved? What does verse number uh, 12 say? It says, buried uh, with him in baptism, wherein also ye were risen uh, with him through the faith of the operation of God. See, this is a, see, when, when, you are, when you are baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, do you not know that God performed a spiritual operation on you? Just as in the Old Testament, as the covenant was being cut, the foreskin of the male child on the eighth day, that skin was cut away from the child. Sin is being cut away and eradicated from your life, spiritually. And by faith, we're trusting in the operation of God. So when a person tells you that they were saved and then got baptized, they just misunderstand what the Bible is saying. You see, you are seated with him in the activity of the spiritual our circumcision. How did it take place? Buried with him in baptism. We're trusting in the operation of God. The very operation that raised Jesus from the dead is able to eradicate sin out of your life. And so therefore he says, back in our text, uh, that we have to understand that God has performed something magnificent in your life when you uh, were raised from the dead with Christ. Uh, we have been seated in heavenly places with Christ. Uh, why? Because our position is in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3. I know there's three things that took place there. Uh, the threefold process. First of all, your position. You are now seated. You've been made to sit with Christ. Right? Because you're in Christ. That's not based on what you do. It's based on what has been done to you through God. It's not what you have achieved, but it's what you have received by faith in God. And it has everything to do with your walk. None of your manner of life in Christ. Then, see, your walk is the practical outworking of what God has worked in you in Jesus Christ. So therefore, uh, it's an outworking of our position. If you're in Christ, your walk is going to have to begin to manifest and reflect your position in Christ Jesus. Now, how do I do that? Well, I need to be able to know that because of this outworking, because of my position sitting in Christ, because of my now, my walk, or my manner of life, I got the spiritual wherewithal to fight spiritual warfare because now I can stand when I face the adversary. See, when you have to go to warfare, in warfare, you have to have the right kind of stand. In other words, you have to be poised for conflict. Poised for conflict. For God knows uh, that we need to be able to stand. The extravagant result of God's grace is manifested. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 7. I'll move kind of quickly here. In verse number 7, the Bible says what? It says that, in, that in, age, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace, by grace, you are saved through faith. And that not of yourself, we've already stated that, is the gift of God. Not of works that any man uh, should boast. In other words, the result of God's grace is going to show up in uh, the fact that we who are enemies are now friends. You see that? We have come from foe to friend. Because of what God has done, resulted in our new position. It's given us a new position, a new walk, and a new stance. And therefore now, uh, we understand uh, the ramifications of God's grace. It is grace through faith. I often say the salvation, there are two sides of salvation. There is what God does, and is what man does. Now before we be misconstrued what I'm saying. I think I'm talking about some meritorious kind of thing. We're saved uh, by the grace of God. God's initiative. You can't, you can't save yourself. But when God offers you salvation through the preaching of the gospel, that you may now be saved, we have to receive that and embrace that by faith. 
We have to make a faith response. But when the Bible says you're saved by grace through faith, there is a God working of his grace toward your life. But then the means by which we receive it is through our faith. That's why Hebrews 11, 6 says, without it, it's impossible to please God. You see that? And let me get to the end as we close. Speaking of the mighty salvation that has already been won, we have been made alive together with Christ, raised up with him, and made to sit with him uh, in heavenly places. What God has accomplished in Christ, he has also accomplished for us. Understand, we have now a transition from death to life with power to live the abundant life right now. See, the abundant life is not something we have to wait until we die and go to heaven for. No, 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 no. Just hold your horses. But Jesus said, I've come that you may have life right now and that you may have it more abundantly. He wants you to live a quality of life that is God glorifying. A life that is so attractive that others want what you got. And to bring me to my final point, which is very, very quick, we have to have a realization of what God desires to do through you. Hello. Again, verse number 10. It says, For we, <laughs> for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained, uh, that we should walk in them. This gives you purpose. Understand the fulfilling of your purpose in the kingdom of heaven. It all boils down to the what, why, and when. Notice the what. It says, you know, what are you anyway? It says, we are God's workmanship. That's what we are. Oh, yeah. We are God's workmanship. In other words, God has uh, recreated you. Go back and look at the uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 17, where we talk about if it may be in Christ, it's a new creation. We have been recreated. We have been reconstituted. <laughs> we have a new purpose, a new outlook, a new marching orders. All of those things have been made new because of by virtue of our relationship and position in Christ Jesus. Why? Uh, for the purpose of good works. Yeah, we're his workmanship. Not to talk about how good we look. No, but that we may engage in good works. Come on now. Hint, hint, clue, clue. Whatever you think about what you need to be doing as a Christian, understand you've been created. Uh, uh, you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto or for the purpose of doing good work. Now, the, the church may not say, okay, this is what you need to do, brother and sister, so-and-so, but you understand as a human being, a member of the, the citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you understand that something good you ought to be doing. If the church does not have a, a program, quote-unquote, that fits you, where you are a committee of more, you can do something that, that gives glory to God by yourself. Why? For the purpose of good works. And these works have been prepared for the foundation of the world. In other words, God has always had you in mind. God has always wanted you to be a purposeful person. Even before you were created, he put you on this planet to make a difference. Yes. And therefore, you are not jumped because you are a function according to your desire. Just watch our hand on my hand, on my wrist. Brother Mary, well, that's a nice watch. Only reason why it is of any significance is because right now, he, he could, could hopefully keep on doing it, but it's telling the right time. I can have a strip and watch on my, on my wrist, but if it's not telling the right time, it's junk. Because it's not functioning according to its design. Are you functioning according to your purpose? Are you functioning according to what God created you for? Well, Brother Barry, well, I just don't know where and how to find my purpose. Well, I'm glad you asked me that. I want to give you some beats. To march back. Because God has prepared you for good works. Uh, and, 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 and the harmonizing of the human uh, and divine works come together when I begin to realize that number one, I will say thank you, God. Write this down. How do you begin to engage in good works? How do you find your purpose? Start thanking God for where He has taken you from, what He has delivered you to, for how He is blessing you in, in the right now. Begin to have an attitude and gratitude for what God is doing in your life. Every day you get up, you ought to have a, a, a song in your heart. Uh, uh, 
you have to some kind of manifestation of joy because of what God is doing in your life. Even though we live in a situation right now where every day they're talking about so many thousands of people, hundreds of people are dying because of this plague that we're in right now. And, and, it's, and, and, it's, and it's running rapid. And you see how this plague is beginning to reveal the character of man, the depravity of man, uh, the selfishness of man. All of those things are being manifested and revealed. See, this plague is simply taking the covers off that you can see who you really are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore, faith denotes the human response uh, by which God's salvation is received. In other words, God is giving you salvation. He's giving you the gospel to believe that Jesus Christ is, not, is the Son of God, but also that you need saving, that you are lost. And see, that's where confession comes in. I acknowledge that I can't do it by myself. I acknowledge that only you, God, are able to save me. I have my, I'm bringing myself to you, falling at your feet. Here at your disposal, take me, you man. How you see fit? Yes, confessing Jesus as Lord and being willing to be buried in the water and grave of baptism. So therefore, the spiritual circumcision can be taking place in your life. Buried in baptism, you're trusting in not your goodness, but the operation of God. A new walk entails carrying out the kingdom agenda. We do that when we understand where God is brought us from, what he is doing for us, what he's doing in us, and what he wants to do through us. I hope you will be blessed by that message. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your grace uh, that gives us everything that we need for life and God. And even to God, as we go through our, our lives, help us to have an attitude of gratitude, thanking you for who you are and what you are doing in our lives, uh, walking away with a renewed commitment to walk um, in a manner worthy of the gospel, to begin to live a life by saying thank you, by saying, here am I, send me, by saying, whatever you want me to do, dear God, I am at your beck and call, that I may interact with others in a way that they can see and understand uh, that my life has been changed. I've been transformed. And now I'm living a transformed life to your glory and your honor. Help me to be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks me of the hope that I have within me. Be with us as we go throughout our week, empowered and rededicated to one dying service for your kingdom's advancement. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm.